Hello and welcome. I am delighted today to chat with the Reverend Dr. Frank Thomas about his recently published book, The God of the Dangerous Sermon. Dr. Thomas currently serves as the Nettie Sweeney and Hugh T. H. Miller Professor of Homiletics at Christian Theological Seminary, where he also serves as director of the PhD program in African American Preaching and Sacred Rhetoric. Dr. Thomas, thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. This is a wonderful opportunity, and uh, I look forward to see what this conversation is going to be. Well, I do as well. I, I so value your time, and, and, and thank you so much for this great book. It's the third book in a series on preaching a dangerous sermon, mm -hmm. and I'd love for you to share with us what's at stake for you in this idea of preaching dangerous sermons, and what in it spurs you to write and to teach towards such a homiletic? Well, thank you for the question. Um, initially, I began to work on the How to Preach a Dangerous Sermon back in 2016, ahead of the election at that time, uh, Hillary Clinton versus you know Donald Trump. And I had virtually written two-thirds of the book with the expectation that Hillary Clinton would be the president. And then Donald Trump became president, so I had a a greater sense of urgency relative to um, the voice coming out because, you know, writing is a part of the process of where I stay sane. And I write to stay sane because when I look at events, look at the world, look at the Bible, you know, so it was like the worst case scenario for me was that Donald J. Trump would be president given white supremacist tendencies given white supremacy installed in the highest office in the land, given that I think the greatest challenge that has ever faced African-American people in particular and will ever face is the question of white supremacy, which is the issue for me that there are some, not every, you know, so I say this in every book that I write in this trilogy, that there's nothing wrong with being uh, European-American it's how you act out that history and that heritage. And some people act out that history and heritage in terms of supremacy. And so it's a threat to those of us um, who are non-Euro-American. And so I wrote the book because I believe that there's a, a moral order in the country, a moral hierarchy. Some people are at the bottom and some people are at the top. And how I define a dangerous sermon is when you preach on behalf of the people at the bottom, specifically addressing the people at the top, you know, it gets pretty dangerous. And so in the challenging times of the post-216 election, the transition, the upheaval, um, I thought even prior to that, that dangerous sermons were, were necessary. They became even more necessary. So I put this book together. It's called How to Preach a Dangerous Sermon. And it was favorably, very favorably received. And so I would go around the country and lecture. And when I would lecture, people would ask me, I want to preach like that, but how do I still maintain a job? Or how do I stay employed? Or how do I survive, you know, if I'm preaching dangerously? So then... Um, you know, I put together the second book called Surviving a Dangerous Sermon. I never intended for there to be a second book. My intent was just to have the first book, How to Preach a Dangerous Sermon, except as I went around the same question, you know, what is a dangerous sermon and how do I survive it? You know, and I answered that, tried to address that question in um, Surviving a Dangerous Sermon. And then as I was reflecting out of Surviving a Dangerous Sermon, I realized, particularly given so much of the rhetoric and the white supremacist rhetoric and the um, evangelical Christian support of so much of this white supremacist rhetoric, that um, there's a God behind every sermon that we're appealing to, and either it's a universal God or a tribal God. And so in, you know, The God of the Dangerous Sermon, I did a... Um, a, a close reading of uh, Donald Trump's um, Rose Garden speech and jaunt over to you know the St. John's Church and holding the Bible upside down and all of that. And I began to, who was he appealing to? Uh, and 
what kind of God was he asking? He's appealing to Christians who have a God that's very different than this behavior that I see. So I say, if you're God, if you're supporting racism, you must be serving a God that's racist. I know that you know, that's hard for people to, to grasp that. You know, they, if you can support white supremacy and you stand there and hold a Bible and Christians support you standing there holding the Bible in the midst of all the white supremacy that you're advocating, then this is a tribal God. This is not a universal God. So I serve a universal God, a God that's interested in all people, not just one tribe not just one tribe being superior. So I put all it together in uh, The God of the Dangerous Sermon, did some historical work um, in the book. You know, Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln is wrestling with the same issues that we're wrestling with today. So I called it uh, Abraham Lincoln's Moral Imagination, Slavery, Race, and Religion in the Second Inaugural Address. That we're still grappling with these questions the legacy and the history of slavery, of course, race, and the connection of religion. We're still grappling with those. So I argue way back in How to Preach a Dangerous Sermon that we have a lack of moral imagination in this nation and that the question of our ability to see a country where everybody can be included, that everybody can be involved and no one group has to be the supremacists over everybody else and with men and we the real Americans and y'all not the real Americans and you know they draw the circle very tight that it always seemed to me that out of oppressed people, whether that's you know same sex or black black or you know women womanists I mean you know this whole um, patriarchy and that somehow the people who are oppressed seem to have more imagination than the oppressors. They have more, ma- more moral imagination. So you get Martin Luther King Jr. talking about a nation, you know, the living out his creed, you know, everybody and involving. So I'll stop there. I know that response was much longer than what you intended or I intended, but I think that gives a synopsis of the whole trilogy. Oh, no, I think that's really helpful. You've named some really important pieces that you you really draw to fruition here in this book, Uh, one of them being uh, your working gospel, uh, which for you, you name so helpfully and so clearly, is uh, Jesus as the prophetic Messiah that we see quite clearly represented in Luke's narration of Jesus' first sermon. And then you also talk about this, the importance of moral imagination. And in your first book, you draw upon Dr. King's speeches, Robert F. Kennedy's speeches to to show us what it looks like Mm -hmm. and and you know like i understand why people were wondering about surviving when literally these two exemplars of moral imagination did not survive after they you know launched the attacks that they did on the reigning power structures uh you you bring rhetorical theology so clearly to bear in this and i thought your development of this uh, rhetorical theology, uh, you, you, brought up, you brought in some very robust conversation partners. You had a lot of work with uh, Reinhold Niebuhr's work and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s work and James Cone's work. And you situate this uh, vis-a-vis the, the global racial paradigm, which ties back in with your focus on challenging white supremacy and structures of injustice. Uh, can, can you help us situate how the theological and the socio-political environment in which we preach, like come together uh, for the preaching moment? Well, I I think that it's very difficult to preach theologically without consideration of the of the social and the political, the situations in which people are are found. And in, so I think I I start in, in, um, yeah, in How to Preach a Dangerous Sermon. there was a group um, of preachers under the leadership of John MacArthur, I believe, who published a statement that um, social justice preaching was a heresy. And it was a distraction from the gospel. 
And so I said, well, maybe from the crowd that you preach to, the crowd that I preach to, um, in the communities from which I come, and to communities to which I do the majority of my preaching, uh, social justice preaching matters very significantly. So when you see unarmed African-American people being killed, police violence is an issue. Uh, when you see poverty, when you see um, disparate health care, food deserts, homelessness, joblessness, you know, lack of employment. So if you're a pastor and you stand by the stream and you keep pulling people out of the water because they're beat up and wounded, I mean, sooner or later, somebody has to go upstream and say, who's throwing these people in here? And so when you go upstream and ask who's throwing these people in, you're doing social justice preaching and very much different than being a heresy. So then I took a step back to Andre Reznor and did this thing called Working Gospel. That there is no, this is a dangerous statement, no pure gospel that we all receive. I mean, there are different gospels. I mean, Paul and Peter had different gospels and took a big meeting in Acts 15 to try to get that thing settled. And so, I try to say, you need to speak to which gospel are you speaking from? What's your gospel? So maybe the better question than what is the gospel, what is your preferred gospel given your context? And maybe if we could handle it on preferred gospel, we may be able to have a very different conversation versus your gospel is legit and you know this is not, this is not legit though there has to be some standard Every, everything can't just go you know per, everything can't be permissible everything i mean you got to have some boundaries and some lines somewhere but i ask people you know tell me about your my working gospel is the prophetic messiah my working gospel is you know the spirit of the lord is upon me anoint me to preach good news to the poor proclaim release to the captives this is luke 418 that's the prophetic messiah and Everybody don't follow the prophetic Messiah. And so what theology really is, when we really get honest about it, is it's a ranking of texts. Nobody believes the whole Bible. We rank texts. So, for example, out of the tradition that I came from, um, you know, we wouldn't preach slaves be obedient to your masters. Or if we did, we did a radical interpretation <laughs> than what the average text says. So all of us prioritize te texts. <clears throat> there are some texts that we rank high, in, and that's called theology, the ordering of text and being honest about how you order text. And so some people order a personal salvation that's private. And this is where I hit, you know, Reinhold Niebuhr. This is, this is so, you know, Reinhold Niebuhr argues that 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 a nation or a culture is a clash of groups who are, who are about power. Individuals can be kind. So you have individuals who are very nice, very, you know, da da da. But when people get in a group, not everybody, but it's a whole different dynamic. And it's a group ethic. So when they're talking about love your neighbor, that's an individual ethic. That's not a group ethic. So Ryan Honeywa lays this out very, 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 very well. And so I think that we could have conversation if we could be honest about our gospel and honest about what we prioritize. So I say, this is my gospel. This is what I believe. You know, it's my working gospel. It's my preferred gospel, if you will. And even that concept is dangerous to some people because there is an authoritative word. There's one, you know, this is it. Jesus saves. There's one interpretation of the text. Yeah, but that's in your context. Jesus saves in my context means feeding the hungry, clothing the naked. That in other contexts, that may mean something completely different, but in my context, yeah, he does, you know, he does save. You know, yeah, he saves souls and he saves bodies. So That's a great word. I, I love the close reading that you did of uh, President Lincoln's second inaugural address. And, and to me, 
we, we see the, this tension that emerges, especially for those of us who were trying to, to preach prophetically while also maintaining a degree of pastoral sensibility and sensitivity to our, our, our congregations and, and parishes. Uh, Lincoln talks about uh, malice toward none, charity for all. Like that's a, a kind of a, a key point of his second inaugural. And Frederick Douglass, as you note, responded, too much forgiveness leads to too much acceptance. Yes. Uh, so I, lo I love that tension that you name because I think that's the tension that we all uh, face when we're thinking about preaching dangerous sermons. Uh, I'd love to hear you talk a little bit more about that and to talk about how it's kind of come to bear on, on your preaching. Well, I think basically um, Frederick Douglass raises the, the critical point relative to the South. He said, if forgiveness is too easy, this is a paraphrase of what he said. You all can read it in a book. If forgiveness is too easy, then what you're doing is unleashing black people back to the very people who used to be their masters. Which is exactly what happened. Which is exactly what happened. And the creation of Jim Crow segregation to keep black people in their place and the Jim Crow laws and then the rising of the Klan and what we couldn't get done through the legal process, we get through through violence and intimidation, Klan riots, white citizen councils that, you know, we, this is why African American, many African American people have responded to this Kyle Rittenhouse situation with such, and situations like this, that this vigil vigilantism, taking a law into your own hands has always been difficult for African American people to accept because we suffered so much because groups of people decided to enforce the law according to, with no due process, none of that. And so it's another example of this, this, this rising uh, vigilantism and this, this overzealousness with guns. So I'm working, thinking in my mind about calling it what John Campbell and what um, Johann Saliers, who's a South African homiletician, calls settler religion. That, you know, we, here we are, we settled here, we're in a minority, we circle the wagons, guns, violence, that, the, that, the, that the, the inklings of this settler religion is still here, this settler mentality. Still, you know, we, we're, we're being overwhelmed, we're being overrun, so we have to um, have guns and pistols, and, you know, and I, I happen, I don't, well, I don't, I don't, the Second Amendment is the Second Amendment, but some of the stuff that I'm looking at today is far from what I would call the sane interpretation of the Second Amendment. So, kind of... Um, just really kind of think through uh, what does it mean to be a thinking person of faith? And um, what does it mean when the majority culture will not acknowledge, you know, this whole critical race theory and 1619 and we don't want to teach any history that makes us uncomfortable? And... Um, yeah, you know, if you think you think learning about is uncomfortable, you should experience being African American in this culture. It's really uncomfortable. So, how am I a thinking person of faith? How do I, how do I stay sane? How do I look at the television and um, see violence against this, you know African American people? Being an Af African American male, can I jog through the neighborhood, be accosted? You know, understand your stand your ground. See, that's settler. That's settler. Stand your ground, or um, you know, I can show up with a gun, stop you, demand that you explain your presence, and then a confrontation happens, and then I claim self-defense. Yeah, it's just absurd. It's just, Trayvon Martin. It's it's just all. It's just this is a lot of absurdity, and. Um, I really write to stay sane. I really do, because um, it's hard to be a thinking person of faith. I mean, to have your faith and actually think, you know, to actually have a brain. Um, 
voter suppression law. I talk about this in the book. You know, if if, if you tell me that that um, it's like, let me give an example. I have several people that used to be uh, vaccinated who are close to me, you know, friends. And, oh, they don't want to be vaccinated. And then they, they also go to the Internet and find this, find. No, no, we, I'm, I don't want to discuss that. So if you tell me that there was voter suppression, I don't have no discussion with that. I don't want to discuss with you. Because you, you, you're not living in the world of facts. And so it's difficult if we can't have a baseline about voter suppression, and you don't see that as keeping black people from voting. So in the book, I argue, the number one question, y'all, I'm just going to shock y'all, but I'm going to say it is nigger citizenship is the number one question. Are black people citizens or not? And all of our history in this country, we've been fighting to be citizens like everybody else. So you can suppress the vote, you can do all of this stuff, and it's, it's absurd, you know. The, the thing in Arizona was absurd all that time, you know, searching through and going through and taking the ballots here, taking the ballots there. So when, so when your group don't win, it, it's not legit, but when your group wins, it's legit. So I, had a, I got in a big argument with a friend of mine, and uh, his, his argument, you know, it was, I said, well, when Hillary Clinton won, I accepted it. I didn't go into voter fraud. I mean, when Hillary Clinton lost, I didn't go into voter fraud. And, you know, it's like, so is it that if you can't accept the result, you should be disqualified from the election? If you can't say, I accept the results of what the majority of the people have said, you should be disqualified. So anyway, a lot of this stuff is, you know, hinted at in the book, but it's um it's trying to be a thinking person of faith that that's honest about what makes sense to me uh following Jesus loving all people and wanting a better world for or the way that I say it that every child would have education in their brains food on their tables work for their hands Education in their brains, health care for their bodies. So I just don't want my kids to have that. I want all kids to have that. So that's kind of what, you know, I've been thinking and feeling. Well, thank you for taking those thoughts and feelings and putting them into this book. It has been an amazing uh, honor to get to read it and get to talk with you today. Thank you for your work here, and thank you for helping us all to become more thoughtful and reflective uh, practitioners as we attempt to lean into this gospel calling that, that the Lord has placed on us. So thank you for your time and for your work. All right, man. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, I look, you know, tell me how to go. Tell me how the conversation goes. You know, it's going to be dangerous, I'm sure. It will. Hopefully it'll spur good, good uh, insights and, and uh, we'll all grow from the experience. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me. Thank you.